thank you very much, Steve. This is a very quick talk. This is more or less just an update on what's happening in British Columbia in terms of how we're treating our cardiac care patients. And um, there will be opportunity for questions because uh, Steve's not giving anybody opportunity for questions, so I'm going to take the opportunity out of this one. And you can even ask me questions about that earlier presentation. So no disclosures. Uh, what we're going to talk about is um, how we are using some of the outcomes of our recent uh, resuscitation outcomes uh, consortium information on enhancing our out-of-hospital CPR and uh, talk a little bit about some new technology that may be coming into our organization, some STEMI bypass work we're doing, uh, introduction of pre-hospital thrombolysis in BC, and then ideally my vision for the future of cardiac care. So under Peter Thorpe, who I think just went back to the office to get some work done, uh, BC has really focused on improving our out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So we work very closely with Brian Bruno and Jim Christensen at Can Rock and, and their team to collect data, to report on data, and ultimately to make improvements. You heard about eCPR this morning uh, and a number of other initiatives improving out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And we're really committed to doing this better as we go forward. In fact, I talked I talk this morning about paramedic clinical leadership. And some of those paramedic specialists that we hired, uh, Jenny Helmer, Jade Monroe, Andrew Miller, have been leaders in looking at our data and working with our data analytics people, Julie Wei, who's here, I think, somewhere, uh, to look by hand on our cardiac arrest patient care records to find out opportunities for us to do better. Now, what we did also find out is that um, we all know the importance of high-performance CPR in the field, but we didn't know how well our paramedics were really doing because we didn't measure it. We didn't even really look at the data. We were collecting it. Every time we send a defibrillator upload to our system, we collect it, but we never really looked at it. So we start to do now, and this happened just back in February, uh, February of this year. We started to take the defibrillator uploads from our LifePak 15s and our AEDs, put them through the system, have some uh, a couple of individuals who paramedics who have identified as quality um, sort of experts in this area would take those CPR summary reports, bundle them up, and send them back to the paramedics. And this isn't a assessment process, this isn't a punitive process, this isn't a way to measure their effectiveness, it's an opportunity for allow them to reflect on their practice. So we send them their CPR reports and um, we also send them a guide on how to interpret the CPR report and we also give them some advice on how to improve uh, high performance CPR. So since March, or since February 11th to March 18th, we've sent out 209 reports uh, about out of cardiac arrest to paramedics, and we're getting really positive response. And here's what a report looks like. It's very simplistic, but it provides a lot of information for reflection. It gives them their CPR ventilation uh, compression ratio, their rate, their time on chest, their, their pauses. If it's a life pack 15 with an ALS crew, it identifies the timestamps of when they gave medications, when they defibrillated, the initial rhythm, um, the time that there was no CPR or progress. And again, we give them the opportunity to reflect on this information. And then we ask them to follow up with their paramedic practice educators in learning or their paramedic practice leaders or their unit chiefs if they have questions about this. And we do get a number of emails and questions about this information. So we're, we're giving the paramedics now some responsibility for the high performance CPR. And that's, that's fairly new, unfortunately. This, this has existed for decades. Many of the systems across the country already knew this, but we've just reintroduced this. And uh, hopefully we'll start to see an improvement in other hospital uh, cardiac arrest data and improvement in other uh, in outcomes by, by better CPR. Now I call it an RFP, but we don't really have an RFP going on, but we are looking for new technology. We're currently a physio control province. ALS uses LifePak 15s. Uh, we use uh, AEDs that are from physio control in the field. Most of our first responder agencies use physio controlled AEDs, and the only group that's a little outside is our critical care paramedics use this old product. But we are looking at the uh, change, so we're looking at an eight year contract now to get new devices in, so we're going to refresh our whole system with new devices. Uh, the, uh, all of the submissions are being looked at right now in terms of their technical capabilities as well as their, their cost. We have gone through an ergonomics assessment, so the paramedics can have an opportunity to hands on all the different devices, and within the next couple of months, we'll have the, have the decision. Um, there's lots on the market, as everybody knows. And anybody use the one in the middle, the core pulse machine? Anybody in the room use that one? I use it in Australia. It's the most weird thing. It's a three part defibrillator monitor. So it's got a module that uses an AED, it's got the module that you connect all the cables to that you can put inside the patient, and then you control it all from a tablet. Pretty, pretty cool, but weird at the same time. Anyways. So we are looking at replacing all of our uh, devices over the next uh, eight years, province-wide, and I can't uh, tell you what, which way we're leaning, whether it's Zoho, whether it's Philips, whether it's physical control, because that decision is still yet to be made. Now something that we are doing in the Lower Mainland is we are bypassing the emergency department with STEMIs to go to the cath lab, and we just recently introduced this into the Kelowna area. It's taken us a long time to work with the cardiologists 
in the interior uh, to bypass the emergency department to, to go to the cath lab. So it's taking about three years to actually get this in place. And we only launched this one in the middle of February as well. And uh, the, the wonderful thing is, even though it took us a long time, is we're getting really great data. So the cardiology department and the quality assurance people are providing really comprehensive reports from the, the paramedic time on scene, the paramedic you know, work in the field, the initial transmission of the 12 lead, uh, the, the bypassing the emergency department arrival of the cath lab and the outcomes of the cath. So we're, we're now looking at these and early sort of anecdotal information from the paramedics is their door to needle time in the hospitals is really significantly reduced. So we're seeing some really excellent uh, opportunities in this, in this area. Initially, we wanted to get the ACPs to actually to, to reduce the time even more by giving to take to take the lower heparin in the field, which was seen, you know, seemed very simple. Uh, but surprisingly, working with pharmacy and working with some other um, agencies, particularly the nurses, were really unhappy about the paramedics giving those two medications in the field. So we decided to just wait till it got to the cath lab. Anybody here from Alberta besides Phil Yoon and I? Any Alberta physicians? Oh, rats just Phil and I. So I'm going to talk about pre-hospital thrombolysis, and this is um, revolutionary in terms of the BC con context because we haven't really discussed this in depth before now. But in Edmonton, I was involved in the, in the various trials and the initial implementation of this in 1996. So here we are, uh, 2019, looking at something that was in Edmonton in 1996. I thrombolyzed the first patient in a clinic, in a doctor's clinic in rural Alberta in 1997 myself, which was the most memorable and probably most terrifying call of my whole career. Uh, but it's also something that's been proven to be highly effective. So we had a couple of physician champions at uh, Edmonton at the University of Alberta, uh, Professor Paul Armstrong from cardiology and uh, Dr. Rob Welsh, or Professor, Professor Rob Welsh, who took, who wanted to take thrombolysis into the field. So working with Dr. Sunil Sukram, uh, we implemented it into practice in the city of Edmonton and across the northern part of Alberta. And uh, now it's moving province-wide. It's a program that's called Vital Heart, and we're taking all of their learnings and we're bringing them here to British Columbia. So we've got a physician quality assurance project that we're working on in Kamloops. Uh, we've got uh, various parts of our organization, so uh, BCHS Learning, Trevor Campbell, uh, John Deacon is working with this, uh, the team up in Kamloops. We have uh, Suman Deshi, who's a cardiologist trained in Edmonton, who's now working in Kamloops. She's our physician champion. Uh, a fellow named Ross Gibson is our quality assurance lead. And we're implementing a Kamloops pre-hospital thrombolysis program. So Anders Ganstall is our, our local medical director there, uh, working with our folks in the emergency department so that we can, we can implement this. We don't have all the details figured out yet, but we do know that we're putting it onto ALS ambulances. Um, we, I don't need to identify the footprint. We can go as far as, you know, we can go down to Merritt, we can go out to Sycamus, we can go up to Bailmont. We've got a big footprint potentially that this ALS ambulance, ambulances could go to to find STEMI patients. Uh, we need to work with the Emergency Medical Assistance Licensing Board to allow us to use tenecteplase. It's not one of the drugs that's in our scope of practice, but because this is going to be a research project, they're very good at approving us to try research uh, opportunities. Um, we have to figure out how to source the medications. We all know thrombolysis is expensive, or thrombolytics are expensive, and we think we've got pharmacy on board for that. We're working on reusing the Alberta program to rotate the drug through the emergency department, so we use it in the field for a couple of months, take it back to emerge so we don't expire these very expensive medications, and then figure out the 12 lead transmission process to the cardiology uh, department. We've got the, uh, the protocols already written, and again, we totally stole this from Alberta. We've got the inclusion criteria, the exclusion criteria, how we're going to do the process. And uh, we've got uh, you know, the documentation that we're totally stealing. The, um, this is interesting, so Alberta does it with advanced care paramedics, but I worked in Australia and New South Wales where every paramedic in New South Wales is able to administer pre-hospital thrombolysis. So they have what's called a P1, which is a university graduate. They're usually like 19-year-old kids that have gone through three years of university, they come up, they go to the field and they give thrombolytics. So when I went to Australia, I thought these crazy buggers, what are they doing? These, <laughs> This is going to, people are going to die. This is horrifying. I couldn't believe that the ambulance service was throwing out thrombolysis willy nilly into the field. But then I started working for the New South Wales Ambulance Service and actually going through the process, and it was tight. It worked. And they had very strict criteria. You had to be 45 minutes from a, from a hospital, so you're never going to use it in a metro area. If you didn't have access to a cath lab, you went directly to a cath lab. They had really good cath lab access. Um, and the paramedics followed the process to a T, and they all went <coughs> to emergency physician about they've transported or transmitted the 12 ADCG, they talked to the, about the inclusion exclusion criteria, many times a doctor even talked to the patient, made sure it was nice and safe, and it worked, and uh, the outcomes were very, very good. So this is something, again, we're introducing it here, and we think, oh, this is a big deal. 
this is something that we should be providing for British Columbians, particularly those who are outside of the footprint of the footprint of the Catalan. Now, where are we going in the future? In British Columbia, our PCPs don't have access to doing 12 ECGs. They can't acquire them, they can't transmit them. On the PCP ambulances in BC, we still have an AED. And I don't know about the rest of the country, if that's a standard. I know it's not in Alberta. Most of the ambulances in Alberta have fully loaded cardiac monitor defibrillators. Certainly that's the same thing in Australia and the UK. Uh, but here we've got uh, only AEDs on PCP ambulances. And I think that that's a real missed opportunity to provide better care to our patients. So right now, you only get advanced life support in the dense urban population. If you're outside the urban population, you get PCP, who would give you nitro and aspirin, uh, but they're only gonna trans transport you to the local hospital for further care. And I think we can start to stretch cardiac care out to our patient, our PCPs in smaller communities. So we've got these great corridors, places like the Okanagan Valley, the Shushwaps, the Sunshine Coast, the Sea to Sky Highway, that have primary care paramedic stations that have opportunities to rendezvous with ALS, so they can rendezvous with a helicopter auto launch who could administer thrombolysis or at least get you to a cath lab faster. So we really want to work forward to, towards getting 12 lead capability on our patient, our PC, PCP ambulances uh, to figure out liaison with ALS, but mostly transmission to hospital to prepare things and have patients move to the uh, cath labs faster. So more things to come in British Columbia, new technology, a pre-hospital thrombolysis program, ideally stretching our, our 12 lead capabilities for our PCPs and more bypass to cath lab. So things are happening. I think this is an exciting time to be in pre-hospital care and certainly in this, in this province, we've got really great physician leadership, really great engagement with our health authorities and a really committed leadership that's taking these things forward. So I am gonna ask if anybody has any questions before Steve jumps out of his seat. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to just add a comment there that you talked about the new monitor RFK that's out there. The product that we will get, either whichever way we can go with it, will have a scalable functionality. And so basically a, a basic form will be for the PCPs. Then you have your ACP, possibly all to your CCP. And so if we do get to the point where we are going to have the PCPs doing 12 leads, they won't need a new machine, they'll just need different software. Exactly. And the other thing we want is things like, you know, um, CPR feedback. We, we've asked for that in, in our quotes. You know, so it, it, it was a mandatory yeah. requirement. And then data connectivity, so we're getting the, the outcome. Yeah. yeah, so it's really, really great. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of you in the room have probably seen the new physio control device that's coming, that's still not approved in Canada. But things like capturing the video from the video laryngoscope and capturing the video from the ultrasound probe in the actual cardiac defibrillator monitor, pretty exciting technology on the horizon that hopefully we'll be able to leverage some of that.